side of the podium, we should have a light there for you. Yeah, we don't. Uh, it's the other podium that has a light. Yeah, it's not the same one. Why don't you leave it doesn't matter. You're all right? Yep. Okay. We'll be fine. <laughs> I'm uh, used to flying in the dark anyway, so <laughs> nothing changes. Uh, just a little correction, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> my time with mosquitoes was after the war in 1951. I did about six months on them, and then everything changed. We all went to jets, which I thought was a retrograde step. Uh, <clears throat> they were a little bit uh, smoother, but not as much fun. Uh, this is myself and my, my pilot. He was a master sergeant pilot, uh, <clears throat> Dick. He finished up uh, fly, gun commission and finished up flying for BOAC on 707 airliners. Uh, he had an interesting career when he got out of the service. The good looking one on the right is myself when I was a little bit younger. <laughs> I haven't grown much over the years. So, uh, <clears throat> this was when we were training and uh, converting onto the uh, mosquitoes. Uh, we'd, we'd just been crewed up as a crew. Uh, the training course on the navigation night flight of radar, it took about six weeks. And uh, at that time, there were four on each course, four pilots, four, four navigators, and Vic and I sort of got along together, and uh, that's, we became a crew. Uh, from there, we went down to the 29th Squadron, down in Tangbeer, and uh, I'll be talking more about that later. But first of all, I'll give you a little uh, video here, if we may, Paul. Uh, yeah. It's called the Merlin. It's basically about the engines that power the mosquito. And it just takes a moment just to warm it up, and, come through, hopefully. Anyway, the mosquito, it's a long story actually, and it, it really goes back to World War I. Uh, two men were responsible for the creation of the mosquito, Geoffrey de Havilland of the de Havilland Aircraft Company and of course uh, <coughs> Wilfred S. Freeman who disappeared. Anyway, uh, keep that up, it gives me a little bit of light, thanks Paul. Uh, <coughs> Freeman is probably the most unknown airman we had in World War II and yet he was vital to the success of the air campaign, both British and American. He was responsible for quite a few aircraft uh, putting them into production, one of which was a mosquito. And if we go back to World War I, at the end of the war, I'll give you some little statistics here because they're relevant to what we're going to be talking about. Uh, <clears throat> World War I ended, of course, in 1918, and by February 1919, uh, Air Force at the, at the end of the war, which was the Royal Flying Corps, had 193 squadrons. Uh, Lloyd George was the Prime Minister. He appointed uh, Winston Churchill as the Minister for War and also in charge of air as well. And at that time, uh, George wanted to literally cut the Air Force in two, half to the Navy and half to the Army, uh, rather like what happened in America. Uh, Churchill was a big friend of the Air Force and he <coughs> decided it would be kept as one entity on its own. So uh, <coughs> he spoke with one of his friends in Parliament and they suggested that the man to put in charge of it would be a trench art. And he was appointed chief of the air staff at that time, and he's looked upon as the father of the Royal Air Force. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of names came out of World War I, which were going to be quite relevant to what happened in World War II. And there's a lot of them. In the American side, the American uh, uh, flyers in World War I were not a large number of people, and they weren't there for that length of time, just uh, quite a few. I don't know if we could put the light on, if it might help them there back uh, to find a seat somewhere. Hopefully. So, anyway, uh, <clears throat> in the British side we had uh, Tedder, of course. Uh, Freeman was one. He came out of the army as the um, equivalent rank of about a colonel. Uh, and he'd been quite uh, instrumental in trying various techniques. He actually tried the night bombing technique, which was reasonably accurate considering that, that, that time. He also pioneered air to ground uh, radio communication. Uh, as part of the observation thing. De Havilland produced an awful lot of bombers in World War I. The DH-4 was one of them. And they were licensed for uh, production in America and were flown by the Army Air Corps over here for quite a few years in the 20s. Everything, of course, was uh, fabric covered and made of wood. So 
They have been uh, going back quite a long way before they got to, to the point of building a mosquito. Uh, by April of, of uh, 1919, the number of squadrons were down from 193 down to 55. And by August, it was cut back more to 27 squadrons. And then at that point in time, the British government introduced what they called the 10-year plan. There would be no war for 10 years and everything would be budgeted accordingly. And they divided it up, uh, 20 million pounds per year for the Air Force, the Navy and the Army. So that didn't leave you an awful lot of aeroplanes or uh, personnel. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> 1929, moving further forward again, uh, the <clears throat> disarmament was still going on. But by that time, things were beginning to change. And we'll slide forward into 1933 when Hitler came to power. At that point in time, he was elected. He was, uh, he was appointed, and then thir four months later, in uh, March of uh, 33, he was elected by 44% of the vote. So everybody thinks he sort of took over power, but he was actually elected. And by <clears throat> one week later after that, he uh, nullified the Versailles Treaty, made conscription a formal uh, part of life in Germany. Anybody 18 and older was conscripted into the army or navy or even submarines at that time, which formed a pretty damn good submarine force, as I mentioned when I was doing the uh, B-17 talk. Anyway, he also started the Luftwaffe. Now, at that point in time, in 1936, we come along, and the Royal Air Force at that time had no monoplane aircraft. It's sort of hard to believe. Everything was biplanes, even the bombers. Some of them were Hanley Page, and they were chugging around quite well, but no performance at all. Uh, in the meantime, Freeman, who was by this time an Air Vice Marshal, was at the Air Staff College, uh, and then he was yanked out of there in 1936. And the way the structure in, the, uh, in Britain started, you have the uh, Air Ministry, then the Air Council, and they would then designate various people. And he was appointed in charge, or the member for uh, research and development of aircraft. In other words, he was in charge of providing the Air Force for the future with the type of aircraft that we were going to need, especially with things that were happening in Europe at that time. Um, he inherited quite a few projects that were already underway, uh, two of them with the big four-engine bombers. One was the uh, Halifax, the early one, the Mark I, and also the Stirling, which was a, another four-engine bomber. Uh, it, came, it was a pretty good aeroplane, but the problem with the Stirling, just digressing a little bit, and I do it, digress a lot now and again, as you'll find out. Uh, the reason for the, uh, his lack of performance was because uh, it didn't fit in the hangars. The wingspan had been too big, so they had to cut 10 feet off the wings uh, <laughs> so they could work on them inside, and that limited its altitude to about 14,000 feet. Uh, it was still a pretty good airplane. Once you got it off the ground, it flew like a bird, but uh, getting it into the air was a major struggle with Sir Isaac Newton. The law of gravity was always a test hassle. I, I did some time in them after the war, and it, it was a nice airplane, I must admit. Uh, anyway, some other fighter aircraft were in production. Now, at, at that time in Britain, it, there were only about 16 companies making airplanes at all, and only two of them were at any big uh, production lines. That was AV Ro Avro, uh, <coughs> which eventually came up with the uh, Lancaster, uh, and they, also the other one was Hawkers. Now, Hawker aircraft were making a lot of money just selling biplanes to the Air Force. The Hawker had was a pretty damn good fighter. <coughs> it was used a lot for uh, demonstrations in aerobatics. Uh, Freeman was actually the man who started the uh, formation flying uh, aerobatic demonstration teams. Uh, rather like now we have the uh, Royal, uh, <coughs> Royal Air Force, the Red Arrows. We've got one painted outside to look like one, but it's a sing single seat version. By the, the, what was happening in Europe, there was a major rush to rearm. So the 10 year plan had been scrapped, and they had various other uh, time frames that they were going to work on to update the services. And they started with the uh, Hurricane, uh, or got an order for 600 of these things. And then the Spitfire had been uh, flying by this time, uh, Mitchell was the one that designed that for Supermarine. They'd mainly been building flying boats, so this was a major switch for them. Uh, Freeman knew the man who was testing it for uh, acceptance into the RAF. That was up at Boscom Downs, which is down in the middle, uh, middle of the country, down south of uh, uh, 
Winchester, I think it's near the city there. Anyway, uh, he knew him quite well, and, and on the test flight, normally, uh, evaluation of an aircraft when it comes into the service, it goes through Boscombe Down, which is rather like what we do over here up at Edwards Air Force Base. And he knew this guy, and so he flew the aeroplane and called direct to uh, Freeman when he landed from the thing, and so that Freeman's only question was, is this capable of being flown by airmen just fresh out of flight school? And the answer he gave him was yes. He said that all they have to learn is how to handle the flats and put the undercarriage up and down. And other than that, it flies like a bird when you get it in the air. So uh, based on that, he ordered 350 of them. By the time Munich came along, uh, the RAF had now risen to about 124 squadrons and 1,736 uh, front-line aircraft. That was both bombers and fighters. Uh, the actual bombs at the start of the war, we only had 200, but you could call them modern, but we had uh, enough to get by. By the time World War II started in September, the squadrons had ridden up to 163, and we had over 2,500 uh, aircraft on front line ready. What's interesting at that point in time, Britain was producing more aircraft per month than any other country in the world, including America which was quite remarkable. During the Battle of Britain, we were producing more Spitz and Hurricanes than the uh, uh, Germans were making Messerschmitts. So where does old Freeman come into this? Well, he uh, <clears throat> had other things on his plate other than uh, uh, aircraft. He had to decide on engines. The Merlin was a well-proven engine. And to air, before the airworthy certification comes through, they have to run 100 hours at full bore for, uh, as a, a test. And that's quite a challenge. Now, the other engine that was coming along at the same time was the Vulture. The Merlin's a 12-cylinder engine. The Vulture was 24 cylinders. And it was rushed into service before it had completed his test. Uh, he was ha having to handle that as well and order other future-type aircraft and some of the prototypes that were being pushed forward. Now, he was the only one that, in charge of all of this, but he's being fed by other people from Bomber Command, Force Command, Fighter Command, everybody else had a finger in the pie, everybody had I different ideas, and he's being bombarded from all sides as to what was going on. Back in 1938, he and Jeffrey de Havilland met, and de Havilland pro proposed that he could build a wooden airplane, a twin engine using Merlins, that would be capable of doing uh, over 405 miles an hour, and carry a 1,500-pound bomb load, and have a range of 1,500 miles be completely unarmed. And uh, this was something that uh, appealed to Freeman at the time as well, because the stuff that was coming along, uh, the bombers, we had one more coming up, which was uh, called the Manchester, and it was powered by the, uh, uh, <coughs> the Vulture engine. And that was a very unreliable airplane. Uh, it, it barely had enough power to get into the air and just enough to keep it there. And if you did lose an engine on it, yeah. Oh, thanks. You noticed. <laughs> I brought one of my own, but thanks a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, if you lost an engine in the uh, uh, Manchester, the other one immediately took you to the scene of the crash. <laughs> and I, I spent 20 years in the Air Force, and I never met anybody who flew one. Flew one. They either died over Germany or they crashed somewhere in England. It was a total disaster. Uh, he was approached by uh, Chad. Chadwick, uh, Roy Chadwick, who was the designer of, at AV Row at Avros, and uh, he, he approached Freeman directly and uh, asked if he could put four Merlin engines in the uh, uh, Manchester. The, the basic airframe was pretty damn good, and it had a huge bomb load, could carry up to 14,000 pounds of bombs. So uh, he got the glow ahead from uh, Freeman, and hence the Lancaster came in, and became the, the ultimate bomber in World War II. Uh, until the B-29 came along later on. In the meantime, uh, the uh, <coughs> Air Ministry uh, had been approached and Freeman laid out as to what he would like to do in conjunction with de Havilland, and nobody liked it at all. Uh, a lot of people that came out of World War I, as I mentioned, there were two of them, it was Harris and Ludlow Hewitt. Ludlow Hewitt was in charge of Bomber Command at that time, and he was totally against this aircraft, and so was Harris, because they felt that any aircraft that was going to be a bomber had to have a rear turret. 
And once you put a rear turret in an aircraft, it makes a tremendous amount of complexity because you have to run hydraulic lines down to power the turret. B-17 doesn't have that because the gun, at the tail end just wiggles the guns around on his own, man-powered. But uh, in the Halifax when I flew, uh, we had uh, something like mm, 20,000 rounds of 303 bullets in trays all the way inside the long length of the fuselage to get uh, down to the back end. So a uh, turret uh, slows everything down as well. So the bomber boys were all, again, uh, having a, uh, an aircraft that would fly, and particularly nobody believed that the speed of 300 to 400 mile an hour would be possible anyway. So uh, they were again it to begin with. So Freeman was basically on his own to push this thing through. Uh, as a result of that, uh, nothing could be done about it, but he kept uh, going. And by the time the war started in 39, they had a big meeting uh, up in Harrogate, then later down in, in uh, London itself. And up in Harrogate, he and the designers from de Havilland uh, got together and had, came up with a proposal that they could actually build a wooden aeroplane. Now, the Havilland Aircraft Company had been making quite a lot of money uh, selling uh, the old fabric uh, uh, Gypsy Moth, which was a single-seat trainer. This was long before we got the Tiger Moth, which was also the Havilland Aircraft. And just about everybody in the Air Force flew that thing. And I believe there's one down at uh, Orange County. You can, well, you can't get a ride in it, but it belongs to uh, Bill Lyons, uh, an Air Force general who's got quite a few of them down there different types of aircraft. Anyway, uh, de Havilland had also made a little aircraft called the Comet. This was not the jet uh, transport that came along after the war, but it was a twin-engine aircraft. It uh, was made of wood. It's kind of uh, sporty-like, not unlike the Mosquito for that matter, and uh, carried two people in tandem, and it broke the record for uh, London to Australia, which was a big thing in the days of the Empire, where the sun never set. I was raised that way from all through school. That's <laughs> not an uncommon uh, bit of geography in those days. Uh, anyway, uh, it flew there in something like 70 odd hours. And in those days, it took about four weeks on a boat to get to Australia. So this was uh, an aircraft that they, they knew a technology in, on wood. They were also building a civil airliner, which was a very pretty airplane indeed. Four engine job, not big engines, but uh, a very slinky, sleek shape. And based on all that knowledge, they felt that they could do all this. So when they did get together with the high paid help at the Air Ministry and in December of 1939, uh, <clears throat> Freeman pushed this thing through that they could build this thing, but it would be built as a reconnaissance aircraft. <clears throat> they, they thought of a bomber unarmed flying over Germany was not on the cards for most of the high paid help. So, he was the guy that really forced it through and sort of skirted the, the way of doing it and set, set down in the, I think I have the actual date here, on the 1st uh, on the <coughs> yeah, first of December, they did put together a contract and the Havilland went ahead to build this and the prospect was to do it in nine months. It was another one filmed during the war. But it is the, actually the fastest twin engine fighter in World War II and the P-51 was the fastest single-engine fighter, both powered by Rolls-Royce engines, both uh, a byproduct of what uh, Air, Va or Air Chief Marshal Freeman had gone up through the ranks at that time. So he was re responsible for the Mosquito, the Lancaster, the P-51. I know it was made in America, but he was the one that managed to get them to make it with the uh, Merlin engine. And the P-51 was also designed for the Royal Air Force. I think I mentioned that before, but those of you who didn't hear that the particular talk in the B-17, uh, when they were over here trying to purchase airplanes back in 1940, before America was in the war and before lease land, uh, they, were, they approached the uh, uh, Curtis people who were making the P-40 at that time, and that was a hot shot aircraft in the Army Air Corps at that time. Anyway, the change, uh, they tried to buy them there, but they were uh, their order books were full, so they suggested they might talk to the small company on the west coast, which was North American, and if they would agree, they would let them uh, build the P-40 under license. So the RAF team that was over here, the purchasing committee at that time, uh, approached the uh, North American Aviation, and that really was a small company, but the designers were also production engineers. 
So they, their approach was, why do you want to build a P-40 here for us? We can build you a better airplane in half the time and uh, much cheaper as well. So uh, they designed the uh, P-51 for them and it flew in 90 days. And it was built rather like the Mosquito. It was built in two halves, stuck together, and of course that way you can speed everything up with all the wiring and plumbing inside. Uh, of course at that time, the main engine being built in the States, an inline engine, was the Allison motor under General Motors at that time. Uh, we didn't get the Mustang until later when it came over to the RAF. We bought 200 of them as a, a fighter. Of course, the Allison engine wasn't much good, about 14,000 feet. It didn't have a supercharger. And then it was Ronnie Harker, who was the chief test pilot and salesman at the uh, Rolls-Royce at that time. He was looking at it and thought we might be able to put a uh, Merlin uh, 20 in there. So he got permission from Freeman and he had five of them built. Uh, and that, at that point in time, when they flew it, it excelled everybody's expectations. It uh, did everything and it was capable <coughs> of a flight to Berlin and back. It had 15 minutes of combat time over Berlin and still had 20 minutes of fuel when it got back to the UK if the weather was bad. So it was a major breakthrough. It took Freeman to talk to Churchill, to talk to Roosevelt, to get the Americans to build it that way with the Merlin engine. Now, in America, they were building Merlin engines at that time for the Royal, uh, for the American Navy. They were in the PT boats. So that was uh, the, it was a car company, it escapes me at the moment, it's academic. Packard. That's the one, yeah. Okay, uh, they were building those, so that's what changed everything. And he insisted that every, Mustang that was built had to have a Merlin engine and of course that saved thousands of lives in the 8th Air Force because now they had escorts and they went to get butchered over Germany as they lost an awful lot of men. In fact, an Army Air Corps lost more men over Germany than the Marines did in the Pacific and that always startles people but it's a fact uh, because there were 600,000 Marines but they didn't all rush up the beach. Uh, their casualties overall were only 3.9%. On beach landings, it was over 50 to 60 percent sometimes. And when I flew with the Marines, I saw some combat film that was never released to the public, and it was pretty bloody, to putting it in accurate terms, both in every respect of the word there. Anyway, coming back to uh, Freeman, <coughs> uh, he was uh, responsible for the Lancaster, the Mustang, the Typhoon, which was coming along. He got rid of the Vulture engine. He had to put Merlin engines onto the Halifax because the Hercules radial engines and the Centaurus engines had, were running into trouble, so he didn't have those available. And the Halifax ones were not particularly good performing aeroplanes uh, because the aircraft had been designed for a radial engine and then when they stuck the Merlin in it with these exhaust stubs too high up, they could be seen from above at the back coming in because they glowed red. We didn't have uh, shrouds on them like we have in the Mosquito. Can we start some of the slides at the pump? Okay. <clears throat> I'll just show you some of the types of cockpit that they had there. Uh, <clears throat> most of, this is the fighter bomber version, uh, the Mark six, uh, 16 rather. That little bubble on the top is for the navigator. Uh, under the uh, reconnaissance aircraft, they were flying long distances in, deep into Germany. And uh, of course you were outside of the range of the G-box of the radar device that we had uh, for navigation. It was only good for about three to four hundred miles if you could uh, read it through the jamming that the Germans were putting up. Uh, so astro navigation still was hard for the course in those days as well. Uh, <clears throat> and we've got a bubble section here which is not on show yet, as I recall. Uh, and I forgot to bring mine with me, but it's quite a heavy item. It's about yay big. And that would be hooked up to the top of the dome, so we could take uh, shots on it. We weren't doing pre-shots the way we did after the war. You had to do it on the go, and then you had all your books to work in there. The room inside the Mosquito cockpit for the navigator, everything, you have no large chart table like you have in a bomber, so everything is done a little board about the size of the top of this desk here, but that's even bigger than I had in mine. And you had to set your maps up and your charts up and work off that. You didn't have any fancy uh, equipment bags and flag, uh, fancy suits like we have now. Uh, in those days, you just stuff your maps down in your, like, inside of your boat uh, that way, and then 
had as many as you could need in, in strategic places inside the cockpit. It worked pretty well, but uh, uh, my size was ideal for it because uh, <laughs> I don't take up an awful lot of room. The small small navigators were in great demand because uh, the door going in and out is only about this big around, and if you had to get out in a hurry, the pilot could push you out that way, <laughs> without you jamming everything up so he could get out behind you. Uh, so that was one thing, we were closer to the door. Uh, if you uh, barely landed the thing, then the, the top bubble would open, you kick it up once you could get out that way. Next one, please, Paul. <coughs> Next one. <coughs> uh, this gives you some of the types of the engine ourselves. It's a very slippery aeroplane, as you can see. And uh, on the night fighters, See in just a moment. I'll mention all the pad on the uh, propellers, but this gives you some idea of the stacks and the way they're all set up. I'll go to the next one, Paul. <coughs> Again, some of the shrouds and spinners that we had. Uh, only one, two companies merged together to make a, the propellers for all the aircraft in the Royal Air Force. So it's called Rotol, R O T O L, Rolls Royce for half of it, and the other one I can't think of the name offhand. Anyway, uh, they produced them all. You can see the difference on the uh, open here, and then the other one covered over. Now, on night fighters, we had to have these shrouds on the exhaust stubs. Because when you chop the power on that airplane, if you're coming up behind the target aircraft, and you're going a bit too fast, you're pulling everything back. All the flames that come out of there are pretty uh, dazzling, and it affects your night vision. And of course, uh, that's easily lost if you're not careful at night. Uh, the average human human beings, which is all of us here, obviously, uh, <clears throat> you can see about 800 feet in the dark. If you want to test your night vision at night, if you wake up in the night, you want to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, uh, <clears throat> before you switch the light on, cover one eye, then put the light on, then turn it off. <coughs> Uncover this eye. This eye will be blind. You won't be able to see a thing in the room. This one will see everything perfectly. It'll take about oh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It varies with individuals before the red uh, rods at the back of the eye can adjust to the darkness. Animals are much better off. Their cats can see things that you and I can. And the same with an owl. An owl's got an incredible vision. They can see a mouse running around on the ground from the top of a fir tree. So uh, they're really quite remarkable creatures. Go to the next one, Paul. Let's just show you some of the fuel tanks, uh, different sizes that can carry there. Uh, they could be dropped if you needed them. Um, I never did fly anything aircraft with a fuel tank. Uh, excuse me, drop tanks. We did enough fuel to uh, do about three to four hours without adding tanks on it. That's mainly for long distance. Uh, on the trips to Berlin, which we'll see in just a moment. Next one. This shows you the bomb base. This here is the one, the big fat one here. This could carry a 4,000 pound bomb known as a cookie. This is the ordinary one here. And the ordinary ones carried uh, four, 500 pounders, 2,000 pound bomb. The original specification that they, de Havilland drew up was for uh, 1,500 pounds. It was suggested 200 would be, uh, 2,000 would be better, and a 2,000 mile range instead of 1,500 mile range. And of course, they exceeded that. But, uh, on the big fat one there, uh, the cookie, which I think it's in the next shot, Paul, and this is the, the gun layout at the front end for the 420mm cannon. You had four of those and you had four 30 caliber machine guns. The 30 calibers fire 1,200 rounds a minute, a 50 caliber does about 650. And it was always a big a bone of contention in Bomber Command that the Americans had 50 calibers all over their Beach 17s and 24s. And it wasn't until towards the end of the war they started building gun turrets with 50 calibers at the back end. Then eventually they went to 20 millimeter cannon to them. Is it? You said that the aircraft was originally built as a reconnaissance. When did you put the guns in? Uh, that didn't come along. I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you spotted my deliberate mistake. Uh, the first fighter, the first flight of the aircraft was on the 25th of November 1940. So just over 10 months when they built it from scratch. The first time it flew in operation was on the uh, Cologne about a thousand bomber rate. That was on the 30th of March 1941, and that was they went out the day after purely to uh, photograph the results of the raid, which were pretty devastating, really. We never did get another thousand bomber raid at night because we never had enough bombers. 
On that one, they, uh, <coughs> they had everything that flew, two wings, didn't matter. It went to uh, Berlin, uh, to uh, Cologne that night. But it was a major triumph for Harris, who'd been trying to get something spectacular to justify <coughs> the role of bomber command in the war and needing more bombs, which he got. But we never did get more than about an, a rate of 800. It was about normal for a main force on, over Germany. Uh, touching on that, the first uh, fighter version was built, uh, ordered in 1940, and then the first bomber version didn't come along until July of 1941. So it was quite a long time before we got around to that. Go to the next one, Paul. What was the rate of fire of the 20mm? Uh, I'm sorry? The rate of fire on the 20 millimeter guns? Uh, good question. You were in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, can you tell me, help me on that one? I don't know. I'm sorry. It's pretty, pretty damn uh, fast. I know it, uh, I f we fired ours on the air to air firing uh, test, but I couldn't give you a number for, off the top of my head. I'd have to do it all. Anyway, I know if you're in front of it, it's kind of lethal. I hit it one of these things on air-to-air -air firing uh, because the cockpit tend to fill up with the uh, cordite fumes and uh, it gets a bit sick making because you're doing all this sort of stuff, uh, chasing a drone around the sky. This is the B, uh, the, the big uh, uh, cookie bomb. A blockbuster bomb is 4,000 pounds. The actual casing is only 3% of the, uh, the load. 97% is RDX and RDX was a much better explosive than the uh, uh, TNT that the Americans were using. So we'd switched over to that very early on in the war. And uh, this thing, the idea on the cookie, uh, on our trip to Berlin, it's not a particularly accurate uh, weapon. Next one, Paul, I guess, shows it. Oh, no, that's just, that's <coughs> a bomber version with a glass nose. Give one, next one up. And again, uh, this is one, I'll come back to that cookie one as it'll come up later. This is one version of the Mosquito with a six pound gun underneath. Uh, the Mosi could carry all sorts of weapon load. Next one. That's a cleaner version showing the different cells on the engines. And this is a night fighter. You can see the antenna there on either side. And you can see the, the guns here at the front end. And also the shards on the engine. That's particularly critical for the pilot uh, because if that thing <laughs> You thought of white, tremendous amount of uh, flames come out the exhaust. Next, another observation of reconnaissance. And <coughs> we put a whole lot of these together there. Keep going, Paul. This is the night fighter version. This is like the one I flew. There were two types, the 30 and the 36. The 30 was the single stage engine, uh, Rolls Royce Merlin, and the 36 had a double stage. Uh, <clears throat> I flew both. They were both about the same. The performance of the 36 you could go up much higher. Uh, about 36,000 was quite normal for it. And again, you can see the shroud there. You'll notice the size of the, the propeller blades. And these are sort of paddle blades because when you cut, there's no air brakes on a mosquito. And when you cut the power, if you've got a, you've got a pretty slippery airplane there anyway. so. If you get the power off, these blades almost like, act like a windmill and slow you down. Because when you're coming, rolling up on somebody else, you're, you're not banging in at full bore, but uh, you know, you close pretty fast. You, get, you want to get into about 500 feet, and that's easy for the pilot. And for 420 millimeter cannon, you're going to knock them out of the sky. Next. <laughs> this shows you the other one with the smaller blades, a different engine, that's the 36. Next. This is the radar set. This is one taken from a picture. It's not the one. I've got some of my own pictures, but I didn't have this little set up here. That's for the Nexus for the intruder work that we did over Germany at night. This is the SCR 720 radar, which is called the, the Mark 10 in the Royal Air Force. A uh, little touch on the history of radar. I, I do a lecture on that, but I haven't done it in three years. Uh, but basically, uh, <clears throat> we were developing radars, and this. You saw the, that bubble on the nose of the, these two mosquitoes ahead of it. Uh, the scanner in there would rotate 360 degrees. And of course, you're transmitting out there, you blacked off the, uh, the radiation coming back into the, the airplane 
for a couple of reasons. You don't want to sterilize the crew, you know, <laughs> which was always a worry, but it was never actually a problem. And the other one is if you had a candy bar in your pocket, it would melt it. That's how you got your microwave oven from the magnetron valve in these radar sets. It's a long story. If you remember, they used to be called the Oman range, radar range, because you were using a radar technology to cook your food. Anyway, coming back to this here, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the, uh, if you take a, a, a handheld fan that you use to cool yourself down, and you pull it out at the bottom, all these radial lines become parallel lines, and that's what you have on this side here. So this gives me a plan and indication of where I'm uh, looking around the airplane. This one here is a clock face, with the center being here, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. I am shaking a bit here, but it's just the way it goes. Uh, anyway, that's by interpreting these, interpreting these two uh, things, I can tell the pilot which way to turn and drop them down and get behind the target aircraft. This thing here was used as the nexus because one of the techniques on the intruder, and I've got to cover quite a few things with the mozzie here. I think we've got the next one, Paul, if you would. Yeah. This, while we're in the cockpit, the, the pilot's seat here, he'd be facing to the right, of course. This is the G-Box, my radar equipment there. So we've got everything stuffed into the aeroplane. This gives me my uh, position anywhere over Europe, up, up to about 300 miles out. Once we have to D-Day, we move the stations into uh, France, then we could get further into Germany. But the radar on this uh, for reception, for navigation, was only about 300 miles. So we had all of this stuff going in there. Uh, next. <coughs> Coming back, oh, this is uh, another one, no, night intruder, uh, night fighter version here. That's just a normal radio antenna, nothing special on it. <clears throat> anyway, one of the techniques we used with that radar set was to protect the Mormon stream. Uh, towards the end of the war, Mozzies were operating over Germany every night. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Americans were doing that as well. They had 40 of these aircraft, and they used them for several technologies. They, mainly they were used for reconnaissance, but they also used them for uh, uh, working with the OSS and spies. They stuck a, a guy into the, a third man into the airplane, and he would work the radar system. They would use the B-24s on their night intruder work and drop paratroops, uh, spies, into Germany uh, behind the German lines. As the armies were pushing them back into Germany, they were dropping spies in there, and they would have a radio on a very thin frequency, and the American mosquitoes would fly a very specific path over where they knew the guy was going to be, and he would then radio up information of what the German army was doing, what troops were being moved, all sorts of information. The radio system was so small and so tight on the frequency band that any German listening setup, which they used to use when they were checking the underground people for broadcasting to the Britain and during the war and during the occupation, uh, they had to be within 50 feet of them transmitting to be able to find them. So it worked quite well. So how much information they got up and down, sometimes they get nothing at all, depending if they're still around or, or couldn't transmit for some reason or another. That was one of the other techniques. They also had some night intruder work. We knew every German night fighter airfield, and they would uh, fly over there, and it got so bad that the night fighter force in Germany were petrified with the mosquito, because it uh, could uh, pick them up with this type of radar, and, and we used to practice that when I was on the Mosses, uh, intercepting at low level over an airfield. Um, <clears throat> It's kind of a dodgy job to do because you're trying to get the guy, as he comes in to do his circuit prior to landing, you could get down there, pick him up on your radar. Uh, if he was, you could see some of the lights on, on the runway because they had little glim lights, and we did, did, did the same thing on a British bases at night as well. Anyway, the <clears throat> light fighter would eventually get round behind him because he's coming in to land, and you're coming down trying to be below him because you want to shoot up at him and get behind him and shoot him down on the airfield. It got to such a pitch that the average night fighter coming back wouldn't come into a circuit pattern. He'd come in from about 10 or 20,000 feet, practically dive bomb down onto the airfield and get down on the run beam before a mosquito could get him. And <clears throat> I went to a fighter seminar up in Oakland many years ago and met one of the guys that was actually doing that in an American 
a mosquito. It was a really interesting talking to the guy. So the uses of that were at night over Germany, that type of radar, were pretty good. We also had used them for escort on the bomber streams. Now, you're obviously not flying formation or around them like the uh, uh, Mustangs did with the B-17s in daylight. Uh, we'd have mozzies flying on the edge of the bomber force. Now, the uh, bomber stream is about 10 miles long, about five miles wide, and maybe about a mile deep, mm -hmm. uh, all going in the same direction. It would probably be a bit more condensed than that, but that was the normal pattern. And the mozzies would fly at the edges of the stream. They would then switch on Monica, which was a device that we used to have in the bombers that would pick up up to about 40 mile range, that give a, the tail gunner and the aircraft and the Lancaster would be able to see the night fighter coming in. Unfortunately, we didn't know it at the time until uh, a uh, German JU-88 landed by a mistake in England. And it's, if you go to the uh, Air Museum when you go over there with a the group uh, in London at, to Hendon, the aircraft is still there. And it was complete with all the uh, latest German equipment, radar and everything on it. So we were horrified to find out that we were using the Monica uh, transmissions to Holman and our bombers. So they took that all out. So they fitted one up in a mosquito, or several of them. So they would transmit this, and then the German night fighter with his Lichtenstein radar would lock onto the transmission. Once the mozzie uh, uh, would be watching on that little dial that we showed on the set, would pick up the German uh, transmitter. The mozzie would then do a 360 whiz round, then the navigator with his radar set would shoot the other one, the German night fighter down. It worked quite well, surprisingly enough. But that was all part of what the mosquito was doing. Next one, Paul. This is one of the early Mosquito knife fighters. You can see it's a, it doesn't have that rotating scanner in the nose. It was a, a metric system then. The SCR 720 was a, 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 a centimetric radar. <coughs> Next. Here's another pretty picture of the. This is the Mosquito they just restored down in New Zealand. Uh, it's in America now. It's uh, on the East Coast, I think it's in Virginia. We've got some video on that later. Next. Let's give you a cutaway section of what it was like. <coughs> this is the fighter bomber version, as you can see. Uh, they could carry these 60 pound rockets. You could carry eight of these. Uh, you could have your uh, six pound gun, and that was equal to the broadside of a light cruiser. And we formed a group called the uh, uh, Banff a base a strike force up in the north of Scotland on the east coast, and they would patrol over the North Sea. It, uh, it's only a two-hour trip over to uh, uh, Norway. And of course, they were moving ore from Norway down into Germany uh, for munitions and so on. And they were working on the heavy water plant. And of course, they made a movie about that with the 633 squadron. They had a lot of hokey stuff in it, but the flights of the Mozzies and that were really great. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Bomber Command, uh, we used mosquitoes for pathfinder work. They would carry four 500 pound uh, flares. And it, they, we would use Obo, and Obo was a device where we had uh, the bomb aimer sat in England, and the, when you transmit a signal of radar, they're traveling at the speed of light, and so the signal goes out omnidirectional in every direction. So if you know the speed, of, the speed of light travels and the speed of radio waves, same thing. So you can calculate to a, a couple of feet, practically, any distance you want. And Obo had a range of just over 300 miles. For every mile of height you could get a, a for every thousand feet you could get a mile in, in range. And the Mosquito could get up to 35,000 feet at, at the Obo marker. So the, the pilot, the crew would fly out, pick up a signal till they reached, um, if they were this side of the signal going out, they'd hear dots. If they went beyond the point where we had to turn them, they'd hear dashes. So the pilot would then fly a curved flight path down towards the target, which would be in, in the Germany and the Ruhr. Uh, the other, that was the cat station. The mouse station was a single beam going out. And when that was, the pilot reached that, he'd be told to fly at a specific heading instead of flying a curved path, which he, he got to do quite good at because it's a simple, simple thing to do to keep the signal uh, set, a steady tone in your ears. Anyway, as he turned around towards that one, he'd fly a set a straight line and then the ball aimer would release the target markers. 
the accuracy maximum error was 100 yards. That's the length of a football field from 300 miles away. Uh, the bombs were not guided, they were just free falling uh, flares and they would light up the target. Uh, I won't go into all the details in that because it's part of a long lecture I do on, on night bombing. But, uh, they would mark the target and the main force would come in and of course they would keep these uh, flares going. The problem was you could only use one mosquito every three minutes to be able to do the markers because the restriction was in, in the amount of people that could work the beams back in England. Uh, <clears throat> marker force was the pathfinders that became known as the light night striking force. They did all sorts of stuff at night over Germany. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, techniques, we had one squadron, I think it was 623, uh, they didn't have a bomb site, they just had a chalk mark on the windshield. They'd practice air to ground dive bombing every day. And if they were used on marking on the target, uh, the Pathfinder Force, and that was a select crews that had been probably uh, getting so good at navigation, they'd been promoted into Pathfinders. The only difference was a tour of ops and uh, bombers was 30 uh, missions. If you were on Pathfinders, you did 45. Then you had six months off, then you came back and did another 30. In the main force, you had six months off and you came back another 25. So but this usually use you up because the casualty figures ate into it. The mosquito casualty figures were one-tenth that of a heavy bomber force. So everybody wanted to fly mosquitoes, but they went for obvious reasons, but it was more fun to fly them on the big four-engine job. As you're up there for hours, this thing is up over and back and then take the scene like minutes. Uh, anyway, the other technique they used, uh, they would dive, if the main force came in, they would illuminate the target depending on the type of attack. And the mosquitoes, would, there'd be three of them out there uh, as master bombers. They'd come down, circle the target at about 5,000 feet, visually identify the aiming point. And in some cases it would be probably a soccer field in the middle of a city. They would then dive down lay their markers down and the others would circle around and they would direct the traffic would be talking to the main force. So the mozzie, uh, it was in a dodgy position. These master bombers they lost quite a few uh, for obvious reasons. They get all the fl light flag coming up, which is intense and very, very accurate. Uh, <clears throat> then the other ones are the problems, the bombs coming down. So they're not pretty choosy. They're just aiming for the ground. So uh, they'd be around there directing the traffic. Mosquitoes were really very, very effective on that. Um, we had two pilots, Picard, which you're going to see in a moment. Uh, he was killed on the Emion raid. But the uh, other one was Cheshire, and he pioneered a lot of this. He even used a P-51 for uh, uh, doing his master bomber stuff itself, because it was more maneuverable, it, uh, whizzing around there, doing all that stuff. He was the most experienced bomber pilot we ever had in the Royal Air Force, with about 150 missions over Germany, all in heavy bombers. And he was one of two Brits who actually were on the uh, uh, second B-29 that not dropped the bomb in Nagasaki. And uh, he became uh, uh, quite famous after the war. He formed all sorts of uh, uh, homes for what we now have as stress disorders. Uh, he had all sorts of air crew that uh, were experiencing that. I uh, did wonderful work with it. But he has a very excellent bio uh, biography written for him, uh, which if you ever want to read it, it's... Uh, Kind of an expensive book, it's about a hundred bucks, but uh, it's well worth an incredible man. Anyway, that's uh, some of the things that the mosquitoes did. They were also used for dropping um, torpedoes. Uh, that was one effort that they went into. Go to the next one, Paul. <coughs> this just shows you the layout of the fuel tanks and the aircraft. Um, in a mosquito, you had uh, two controls behind the pilot seat where you saw that radar set. They controlled tanks above the board of the engines there. They had to use these up first, and then you had to turn them one way. It was all right when you carried a navigator, but as a pilot was on his own, uh, he had to remember to do that. And if he turned it the wrong way, he switched everything off, and then the law of gravity took over. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, Jeffrey de Havilland did a demonstration once with the Mosquito. He feathered one engine, did a roll, came diving in again, feathered the second one, did another roll, and then <laughs> and feathered on the ass. He must have had a huge supply of batteries in that aircraft to wind that thing and get it started up again. Because the normal battery power would never have done it. But <clears throat> he was quite a daring pilot, and unfortunately he was killed testing that uh, little Delta wing after the war.
walk the jet job. Next one. Oh, no. Again, the big bulge in the bomb bay there. One more. The bomb site they were using in that, oddly not surprised me, is the Mark 9. That was a mechanical bomb site. It had a little compass in it which gave you your heading on it. Whereas on the, uh, the big heavy bombers of that length in Halifax, we had the, uh, what the Americans called the T1, which was the Mark 14 that we had. And it was a computerized site. It was a rather good one, actually. Uh, the bombardier and the B-17s flew the airplane with an Orden bomb site. We just called the directions to the pilot. Uh, but we could back up to about five degrees either side of the level and still hit the target. Uh, we didn't need that much more than that because of the type of bomb we were carrying. Next one. <coughs> That's some of the early night fighters with the uh, <coughs> fixed antenna on the, on the front there and then on the wings as well, as you can see. Next. There's that uh, six pounder gun with the 430 calibers. Next. This shows you the mosquito used in strike command up in the north of Scotland. Uh, acting on these uh, flagships that the Germans would use to escort the convoys from Norway, to, Norway down to uh, Germany, <coughs> they were pretty lethal uh, boats. And, uh, it was kind of a ballsy thing going in there. The expression was, it helped if you had more balls than a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go in and tackle those ships, because uh, they, they were pretty lethal. Uh, with this amount of firepower, uh, there was not much going to stay afloat if you hit them with it at all. So next, this is a reconnaissance aircraft. You can see he did quite a few trips. Uh, I don't know the crew there. Uh, <coughs> this batch of 45, so just at the end of the war. They did 213 operations. That's a lot. Uh, the average life on a bomber was seven or eight missions during the war. Uh, some of them, uh, oddball aircraft made it. Uh, the, uh, Memphis Bell did 25 and they brought it back to the States that it was pushing it. Because that, they did that in the early days before they had the uh, fighter escorts. And uh, <clears throat> Once they got Mustang for escort duty, the casualty figures in the American Air Force, um, uh, Army Air Corps, Eighth Air Force, dropped dramatically. But up until then, they were the same as Bomb Command, two out of three were getting killed. And the average crew in a bomber, the oldest man in my crew was 22. I just turned 21 when I was one of those. So next. <coughs> ah, at long last. This is the uh, famous uh, cookie, as it was referred to. We could carry, in the Halifax I flew, we could carry one of these, and <coughs> which, uh, as I mentioned, had 97% uh, explosive power. <coughs> <coughs> this is, there's normally three of these where the pistol goes in. There's a little set of fins uh, at the back down there. So it has some form of trajectory. Then you'd have cans of incendiaries. This would go down first because it's a heavy bomb. So it would blow all the buildings, all the roofs off the buildings, and all the windows out. Then the incendiary bombs would come in and cluster the whole area and start a fire. Because all the bombs are doing that. Then you get a firestorm going in on uh, the first raid. Uh, uh, it was in March, in May, 43 on Hamburg. Uh, the city burned for four days and it killed about 40,000 people. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the area of bombed at night, the Eighth Air Force came in in the daytime. We went in again at night. They did that for four days. So the city really took a pounding. And of course, it was an old city, an awful lot of wood there, and that helps the fire going. And a, a firestorm sucks all the oxygen out of the air. So people mainly die from asphyxiation other than just the normal uh, burns and so on. There'd be three of these uh, pistols on it, so it was quite effective. The reason we used them on the mosquitoes at night, when the main force were not out on missions, and of course you can only barrel the bomb Berlin in the winter time, because over, you're much further north of latitude there, so it doesn't stay dark long enough, so, except in the winter time. In the summer time, hell, in Scotland, where I was flying mosquito uh, uh, vampires and meteors up there, you get up to 40,000 feet in the summertime, it's daylight. You could see the sun scooting around to come up and schedule. It was amazing. And you get the northern lights and everything else. But over Germany in the summertime, you have the same problem. Uh, that the nights are too short. And so you couldn't do Berlin. Berlin was mainly bombed in the wintertime. 
And of course, we lost about 700 aircraft on the, uh, <coughs> on the Battle of Berlin, and we never won it because it's such a well-built city. <coughs> anyway, uh, the Mosquito at night over Berlin was not using any target information. You were just getting there and dropping the bomb to keep them away. It was also good for morale because about 60 miles away was Stalag 3, and they could hear these things going off. And it just kept the uh, German system alert all night long. So they didn't get too much sleep. Uh, so, and of course, Berlin was a pretty big uh, target and spread out city as well, like LA. So you can't, it didn't matter where you dropped it, you couldn't you'd hit something. And that was uh, kept them awake and so on. But it was a very useful uh, aircraft in that respect. Next one. This is the first prototype and it's in, under construction right now back at Hatfield. It was built in a barn uh, beside a big building there. So it was much secret uh, going around about it. It's never going to fly again, but it's the original prototype painted yellow the way it was right in the beginning. I think that's about all of them there, Paul. Uh, next. next one. Yeah. yeah uh, so we'll take, I'll take a little break now because we're going to run another little video for you. Uh, one of the famous raids I alluded to was the uh, jailbreak on the Amiens prison. This again is done at uh, deck level 50 feet. Um, that's the most fun in flying. I enjoyed every minute we could do down at the deck. Uh, it's a different type of navigation because the, everything's going by. You're covering a mile about every, uh, is it four minutes? You do 400 miles an hour, yeah, somewhere in that range. Uh, so the way you work your navigation is quite different. As long as the pilot's using your headings, you're looking for uh, topographical features the hills and rivers and so on that come by quickly. When you're at a high altitude, you can see a whole vast area and you can pick up pretty well uh, where you are. But at, at deck level, it's much more fun. Even when we switched to um, jets, it was never quite the same, but there's something about a mosquito. It just, uh, I had two or three hundred hours on them. That was all because at the time I got to this quarter, jets were coming in. So uh, it was a different type of uh, flying, but it's, there's something about it. It's hard to explain. I think one of the guys here flew more. I flew more as I gather. Anyway, this will give you an idea of, so again, propaganda film, but it's worth a look. Well, we want to thank Ken. I know we'd like to go on and on and on, but a lot of us are going to turn into pumpkins. And they won't be pretty sight. Ken will stay a little bit later for those of you that have specific questions. He's always one of our best speakers, so we know he'll be back soon again to do more speaking, but his voice is also getting tired. He's also a docent here, so we have to save him to be able to give a tour. Are you here tomorrow for a yeah. tour? Uh, I do want to point out that our librarian has put aside some books on the mosquito if you want to come and browse through them. Our library is open to the public. The hours are posted outdoors. We have, if you want to do further research, we do have some materials for you to peruse. Thank you once again, Ken, and uh, have a safe journey. Next time, remember, you come through this door. We'll have better science. <laughs>